Good morning and welcome here to Denton Burn Methodist Church. A very warm welcome. Um, and uh, I pray that uh, you'll be glad you shared in this time together this morning. Um, on behalf of my colleagues and I, I'd really like to thank all those that have sent emails and messages this week, um, just offering encouragement and support after last week's service um, that people watched online. Um, so thank you for that. It's lovely to be encouraged uh, in that way. Here at Denton Burn, we always start, I usually show two or three funny things that I've come across during the week. So I thought uh, today would be no exception. So uh, I just wanted to show you three things. First of all, uh, some hygiene advice that was posted from a diocese somewhere. Um, you can see there it says snacks can continue to be served, but must in be individually wrapped rather than sharing bowels of crisps, etc not sure I'd want to share any bowels of crisps. Um, and then this second one, this was from somebody working at home that came across this uh, on their instructions. I think it was a risk assessment that says, anti-skeptic creams should not be kept in first aid containers. <laughs> anti-skeptic creams, interesting. Didn't know there was such a thing. Perhaps we need to get some. And uh, thirdly, lastly there, um, I love this one, just a picture of the Pope there working in the office and perhaps after a few days working from home. I guess that might apply to uh, quite a number of us actually. <laughs> so we're going to share now in some words of gathering and prayer. Let's pray together. God says, I will put my spirit within you and you shall live. Will you believe? Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Will you live as if this were so? Jesus called out, Lazarus, come forth. Jesus still calls us today, come forth. Father God, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. Although physically we may be scattered, in spirit we share in this act of worship together as one to praise you, to thank you and to listen for your voice speaking to us today. We thank you for the love and the support and the friendship of the people that we enjoy here. Lord, you are truly the giver of light in the presence of darkness. You can turn the darkest of nights into the brightest of days. You are the one who leads us from lament into joy. Lord, we praise you and thank you for your work of redemption and transformation among us as you declare to us afresh Behold, I make all things new. Almighty God of creation and recreation, speak words of new life into our lives this very day with all of its difficulties and challenges. Fill us with your spirit to transform us and open our hearts to receive your living word to us, that precious word that never returns void. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour, we pray. Amen. So we sing now our little call to worship song this morning. Come, now is the time to worship. And uh, um, as we often have at Denton Burn, our prayer for the day will be included as part of this song. And the words will be on the screen. Um, let's sing together. Come, now is the time to worship.
loving God, grant us peace and serenity during these times of great concern and anxiety so alien to all of us as individuals and as a nation. Give strength and direction to all who lead the nation from the front and to all who work in hospitals and the care sector. And vision to see beyond the day, Lord, to a brighter future ahead. In Jesus' name, Amen. This is Denton Burns Prayer Table, which was made about four years ago by the woodworking department at HMP Franklin, in memory of Alan Glover, who was a much loved member of this church here for many years. They made a lovely job of it um, in solid beach, uh, and we've seen many prayers answered that have been pinned to it since it's been here. And certainly for us at the moment, it represents a lot of heartfelt prayers of pretty deep anguish, really, in this present crisis. In the scriptures and in our lives, there have always been times of lament and loss. And over this past week, I've just had such a strong sense of people really grieving and a great sense of loss. Loss of, of just normal lives and face-to-face -face relationships in this present crisis. What, I wonder, are you particularly grieving or lamenting over at this present time? What's on your heart uh, at this moment? You might indeed be grieving the loss of a loved one, or it's also very likely that you're struggling with the loss of companionship, relationship, or places no longer visited that ordinarily are so familiar like this church here at Denton Burn. Or it might be the loss of income um, as this current situation really bites. I was talking to a friend only this week whose income from a business built up over 25 years has dropped to zero almost overnight. What kind of loss comes to mind for you today? Just pause for a moment now to hold these thoughts before God. We may be experiencing lament and loss together, but let us never be overwhelmed by it. Many years ago, the prophet Habakkuk said, though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. We're not in the same situation as Habakkuk was, but we are in a period of wilderness in terms of relationships and connecting physically with those around us. You could say that St Paul was once sat in isolation too. He was in prison and yet still he was able to declare in one of his letters to the outside world, rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. So like both Habakkuk and Paul, Let's continue to rejoice in God our Saviour in all the ways that we can at present. So we're going to sing now, Blessed Be Your Name. Bless 
Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Oh, I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Out of the depths, I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits. And in his word, I put my hope. I wait for the Lord, more than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord. 
For with the Lord is unfeeling love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. Amen. As we continue through this season of Lent leading up to Easter, uh, today we look at an amazing event in the story of Jesus and his ministry. Witnessed by many uh, that had far-reaching ramifications back then and that I believe can even impact our lives today too. So we're going to hear now from uh, John's Gospel, chapter 11, verses 17 to 44. Jesus comforts the sisters. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are Christ, the Son of God, who has come to the, into the world. And after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But none of them, but some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odour, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. The following film contains scenes that some viewers may find disturbing. Well, it doesn't actually, unless you find me particularly disturbing. Um, but you do see that sometimes, don't you, at the beginning of uh, some programme or other that you're watching. And uh, I guess you either fall into one of two camps. You either think, oh, I better turn it off then. Uh, or you think, oh, this sounds intriguing. Perhaps there should be a warning uh, like that at the top of this passage that we've just heard from John's Gospel because let's face it some of the content uh, is quite disturbing when you think about it. 
Last week, Jonna led us through each of the seven miracles or signs that the book of John highlights about Jesus's ministry, thinking about each in turn and thinking about what John is trying to teach about the bigger truths that uh, each of those seven signs represent in the bigger story. Of course, there was the first miracle or sign, uh, Jesus' starter miracle, if you like, uh, when the wine runs out at the wedding celebrations at Cana. So even at that early stage, we're introduced to the idea that Jesus had the power to modify substances. And on that occasion, it's the water used for ritual washing, ritual cleansing at the wedding banquet that Jesus turned into wine. And of course, wine was ultimately uh, to become symbolic of Jesus's blood through the shedding of which we are cleansed or washed of our sins. Very powerful symbolism going on there. So that was his starter miracle. And then we're taken through a number of incredible healings an amazing feeding of the 5,000. Uh, there was that gentle stroll with a difference a stroll on water, walking on the top of the chaos of rough waters, and then the healing of a blind man from birth uh, when Jesus heals him and he receives his sight, his ability to see. And if you think about the Christian journey and the transformation that Jesus can bring in our lives, cleansing and washing, healing in its widest sense, feeding and nourishing, supporting us and bringing peace in the midst of difficulties and chaos and you might say giving us new vision too uh, like the man born blind a new way of seeing things there's something powerfully symbolic going on as you journey through the miracle accounts in John's gospel so do watch last week's video uh, if you haven't yet seen it and then we come to this last sign Jesus' raising of Lazarus from death is the final and arguably most climactic and disturbing of those seven signs in the book of John. It being powerfully symbolic of what was to unfold with Jesus' own death and resurrection and his ultimate victory over death. And it's another example where the natural laws that govern how things normally operate in the created order were, if you like, overridden and subverted by Jesus. Jesus, of course, being the one who was involved in creation in the first place. And when you look at this account, it strikes me that perhaps more than any other of the miracles or signs, I think this is the one where Jesus's humanness and his divineness are really kind of shown up in sharp focus together. We're told that Jesus was very fond of Lazarus and his sisters Mary and Martha. Many people had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. Jesus looks at the scene unfolding around them. Mary weeping, all those who'd come to comfort the two sisters weeping. In the midst of this scene of um, sadness and anguish, Jesus, it says, was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. And then, in the shortest verse in the whole Bible, we're simply told, Jesus wept. He cried. He wasn't floating sort of loftily somewhere above the human tragedy in some divine cloud disconnected from it. He was right in the midst of this situation, feeling the same anguish as those around him. And he was deeply moved in spirit and he wept. Lazarus had been his friend too. See how he loved him, they all observed, it says. Jesus isn't purely a God-driven, wonder-working superhero who's nothing like us at all. And perhaps particularly in the situation that we find ourselves in at the moment, we need to be reminded that Jesus is right there with us in the midst of our anguish and loss too. He's not somewhere else. He weeps right alongside us in the face of loss and lament. See how he loves us too. Just winding back a little. When Jesus first receives word that Lazarus is sick, it says that he stayed where he was for two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea and see what's happened with Lazarus. 
Why does Jesus delay in responding, I wonder? Maybe we're sometimes a bit too quick to look for instant responses from Jesus. We want to come before him, we want to present our requests and expect a discernible answer or a response while we wait, as it were, if we're honest. And yet it's clear from many stories of Jesus that timing is everything. And God's timing very often isn't ours. And sometimes we struggle with that. We learn that even before Jesus gets to Bethany, he already knows that things have gone rapidly downhill for his friend Lazarus. And it says that he told his disciples plainly, you could put it really pretty bluntly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. It's almost like he was saying, I'm glad that you know I had nothing to do with the circumstances that we're about to go into. I wasn't there when Lazarus died. It's like this miracle was going to be too crucial to be marred by any doubts. So that's the setting for Jesus and his disciples arriving at Bethany to discover that Lazarus has already been in the tomb for four days. And so four days earlier, they would have prepared his body for burial in the customary Hebraic fashion of wrapping it with spices uh, in linen strips and putting a burial cloth around his face. And then they put him in a grave carved out of the hillside and rolled a cover stone in front. And remember, this is a hot and arid climate and the account doesn't pull any punches decay had already set in. Lazarus's body stinks. And so miracle-wise, the scene is set for the big one, you might say. Jesus isn't even in the area when Lazarus died. He delayed his intervention and now we have a decaying body in a hillside tomb that stinks a bit after four days and we've got a shed load of witnesses. And so the great turning point is when Jesus turns to Martha and says, your brother will rise again. And then we have that great declaration of Jesus that we affirm at the start of many funeral services when Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Jesus is saying essentially this this death, this despair and grief, I share it with you, but none of this has the last word, not in my kingdom. I am the resurrection and the life. And Jesus then turns to Martha and says, do you believe this? And you can almost imagine the emphasis of Jesus, no, 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 do you really believe this? Because you need to prepare yourself for what's coming next. This is going to turn how you see the world upside down because this is what my kind of hope looks like in the face of a situation of absolute hopelessness and death. This is what new life looks like when everything about the current reality of the situation stinks, even literally. So you do you really believe it, Martha? And we could have we could of course also ask at this point Do we really believe it? That Jesus is really who he said he was, the resurrection and the life. Because this sign was given and witnessed by so many at the time and this account written to leave us in no doubt about who Jesus was, the Messiah, the anointed one from God. And not just some good teacher with some worthy sayings alongside many other good teachers. This miracle wasn't just a miracle for Lazarus' benefit. It was a sign for all of us. So we come to the moment where we'd definitely be saying some viewers may find the following scenes disturbing. Jesus looks up and prays to the Father. Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. Jesus commands into the darkness of the tomb 
Lazarus, come out. What a moment. Everything hung on this. What was going to happen next? And if this was a two-part series, uh, here would be the cliffhanger. Watch next week. Although I guess preaching like this on video, you could now press pause and go away and make a cup of tea as a bows. Lazarus, come out. And so the people watch and wait. And then it says that the dead man emerged from the grave, covered in the strips of cloth he'd been buried in. And I love that next line of Jesus when he turns to those around him and says to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Or perhaps we could put it another way, set him free from the clothing of death. Jesus enters this situation of grief and hopelessness, shares in their grief, declares himself to be the one that brings resurrection and new life. And we end with, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Doddering around with burial cloths wrapped around you is no way to be dressed once Jesus has taken on and conquered the big one, which is death itself. And it's important to remember that at the end of this passage, it isn't exit stage left for Lazarus. He then very much remains part of the ongoing story after that. We're told later that Jesus actually returns for a meal with Mary and Martha and Lazarus later on. One can only imagine the discussions around that dinner table. Lazarus, remember that day when... <laughs> Or perhaps it was more Mary and Martha saying to Lazarus, um, this time eat your greens, please. <laughs> However that mealtime conversation went, it was because of the raising of Lazarus from the dead that many people really started to believe that Jesus was the Messiah, the anointed one sent by God, much to the consternation of the chief priests and as a result, it says that they made plans to kill both Jesus and Lazarus. So Lazarus remains very much part of the story and on the scene afterwards. Now, just to clear up a bit of confusion that might be in the air, Lazarus was raised from death by Jesus, yes, but it wasn't the same as the resurrection of Jesus himself that we celebrate at Easter. Lazarus didn't beat Jesus to it. You might say that with Lazarus it was more of a resuscitation of his existing physical body rather than a resurrection into a heavenly body. Lazarus was raised, yes, but um, Lazarus would ultimately die again, even though he died before. At Easter we celebrate Jesus being raised from the dead, but raised to never die again. So there is a difference between Lazarus and Jesus. St Paul says that when Jesus rose from the dead, never to die again, he became the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Lazarus, along with all who trust in Jesus, will ultimately represent the rest of that resurrection harvest, if you like, from those who have fallen asleep, as it's put. So I don't believe that, uh, that Lazarus beat Jesus in the resurrection race, just in case you were a little confused. But to finish then, what does this Lazarus account mean for us? What's the so what about this story? Is this little more than the, you know, biblical version of zombie flesh eaters? Or is it so much more than that? Well, I guess the most obvious thing is that it means the same for us today as Jesus intended it to mean for those mourners who witnessed this event firsthand. In Jesus' own prayer, that they may believe that you, Father, sent me. That we may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Anointed One sent by God. This event was witnessed by a large number of people and it had far-reaching ramifications for the story unfolding subsequent to this event. So we can be assured that Jesus was and is who he said he was. But can it mean even more than that? If changing the water into wine at Cana was Jesus' start of a 10 miracle, what about this seventh and final miracle or sign in the book of John? 
I believe that for all who come to know Jesus, resurrection, in one sense, starts in the here and now. St Paul once said, therefore if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. Resurrection then has already begun. So here's a question. In what ways then does Jesus metaphorically command us to come out from our tombs, whatever those tombs might be for us? Do we sometimes prefer the shadows? What represents the close of the grave for us? Things that aren't life-giving, that we've somehow allowed ourselves to be clothed in. To say that this event will have been life-changing for Lazarus must be the understatement of the century. Are we prepared to allow our lives to be changed as Jesus commands us out from our tombs? And does Jesus need to say to us, essentially, take off the burial clothes and set yourself free? Lazarus wouldn't have represented much of a miracle if he'd remained waddling around like a zombie flesh eater with all of his grave bindings still on. But what kind of grave clothes might we need to release ourselves from? to be truly free in Jesus. I believe that in our personal lives, as well as in our lives as a church community together, because of Jesus, there is always the hope of new life. There's no situation, however hopeless it may look, even if it has all the hallmarks of decay and death, however much a situation may even stink, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. In me, you have hope. I am the one sent from the Father, and in my timing, I make all things new. Over the course of my life, I've really come to believe for myself that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, and that he is risen and living and actively nudging our hearts through his Holy Spirit. And like Lazarus, I'm sure that there are times when he weeps over us, whom he dearly loves too. And he stands amidst the grief and calls every one of us out of our tombs. He stands and commands us all out from any dark shadows that represent death or decay in some way in our lives. And just like Lazarus, he dearly loves us and he can work a miracle of resurrection in our lives too. No matter how decayed or far gone we might think we are, no matter how much of a lost cause maybe others think we are, Jesus calls us out of the darkness and into his marvellous light. And he turns to us and says, take off the grave clothes, you're free. The scriptures tell us that because of what Jesus ultimately did on the cross, we all get, metaphorically speaking, clothes that look different before God. Not the old ones that we've stained or messed up, not grave clothes suitable only for a tomb, but royal robes of righteousness that we don't deserve. That's how we appear before God because of what Jesus achieved on the cross. That's Jesus' free gift to us. We're free of whatever tombs we were in, free of decay and dressed in royal robes. That's his free gift. That's what we call his grace to us, his amazing grace. It's a gift. In different ways, we're all Lazarus. May our hearts respond to Jesus' call and may we experience that new kind of life that, like Lazarus, changes the rest of our story forever. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for these amazing stories that come to life and speak to us. We thank you for the accounts of the miracles that reveal so much about Jesus and who he was and what he can mean to us. Lord Jesus, you are the resurrection and the life and you call us in the here and now 
out of whatever tombs or shadows in our lives that we sometimes hide within and amongst, shadows that we're sometimes comfortable in. Give us the assurance, Lord, and help us to realise afresh that new life in you begins in the here and now. Our resurrection, in a sense, starts as soon as we respond to your voice and that through you and the new life you bring, Lord, we can emerge from our tombs and take off our metaphorical burial cloths, whatever might still be binding us and keeping us in our old state or our old ways, and we can be set free. And we praise you and thank you, Lord, for this wonderful truth. In your precious name, Lord, we pray. Amen. So we're going to sing again now. We're going to sing that lovely old Wesley hymn, And Can It Be?
prayers of intercession. Let us pray. We pray for our church family that helps us grow in faith, for all who lead worship, for, for all who bring your word to us in other ways, and for all who minister to us. May we be helped to know and love God better. May we soon be able to meet together once more. Loving Father, hear us and help restore us. We pray for those who weep today through different kinds of loss. For broken relationships where there seems to be no hope. For families destroyed by death, poverty, war, violence or abuse. For those who feel let down by society and for those who feel let down by you. May all know your presence in those dark times. As they wait on you, comfort them, Lord, we pray. Lord, weep with us and bring fresh hope. We pray for all people separated from their families, the homeless, the refugees, slum dwellers, those who cannot maintain social separation, the lonely and those feeling forgotten and unwanted, those in self-isolation or advised to shield themselves at home. We pray especially for those in care, both young and old, that they may stay safe. We give thanks for our own homes and ask your blessing upon our families and our friends. We ask you especially to bless all those forced apart by social distancing. We pray that they all may soon be restored to their loved ones. Loving Father, hear us and help restore us. We pray for all who weep today, for those who grieve and mourn for the loss of loved ones, husbands, wives, mothers, fathers, daughters, sons, brothers, sisters, friends. Loving Lord, weep with us and bring fresh hope. We give thanks for your loving care. We ask your blessing on all those who have lost a loved one this year, who have departed this life and are at peace in your kingdom. Loving Father, hear us and help restore us. We pray for those who are caring for people who are seriously ill or at the end of their earthly lives. Nurses, doctors, hospice workers, carers, chaplains, pastors, undertakers. Give them strength hope, courage, empathy and love as they walk with those who weep. Lord, weep with us and bring fresh hope. We pray for all who are known to us, who are ill, at home or in hospital. We remember families where family members are ill we ask your blessing on all families where there is overwhelming distress. Loving Father, hear us and help restore us. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Redeemer, Brother and Friend. Amen. 
we continue in prayer now as we pray together the prayer that Jesus himself taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. It's been good to share in this time together with you. We're going to sing our final hymn or song for this morning. Uh, this is a lovely arrangement of Be Thou My Vision that my friend Pete Brazier, who's a minister down in the Dorset South and West Circuit, um, has put together. So let's sing and enjoy together Be Thou My Vision. So may the peace of the living God be with you wherever you may be. May you cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. And may you know that Jesus who called Lazarus out from death to life can change your lives too. Amen.